Now, since we're meeting in this lovely bookstore, surrounded by all sorts of enticing titles, I think it's appropriate for me to begin explaining why I wrote this book and what it might tell us about this rather dangerous moment in world history. Thinking and writing about the United States as an empire, the topic of the book, has always been an ideolo ideological minefield for historians like myself. During the 40 years of the Cold War, the Soviet bloc used the Marxist-inflected term imperialist to denigrate the United States. So in this country, the United States might be a world leader or even a great power, but we were never an empire. Our enemy, the Soviet Union, was the one with an empire. America was an exception, and its historians thus subscribed to a doctrine known as American exceptionalism. But in the aftermath of the 2001 terror attacks and the dismal 2003 invasion of Iraq, the term empire lost its subversive taint, and policy specialists right across the political spectrum began to embrace the concept of empire and ask whether or not the United States global power might be in decline. So at the peak moment when its dominion was being challenged, history's most powerful empire was arguably its least studied. Suddenly understanding the distinctive way that Washington had been exercising its world power was no longer some kind of academic parlor game, but a matter of pressing public concern. For if this nation's unprecedented wealth and prosperity were based upon its global power, then understanding the US exercise of that power was essential if not to perpetuate the power, but at least to manage its decline to allow for the most peaceable transition possible. So at this time of a major global transition, we need to go back to basics and try to understand the nature of global power, how it is won, how it is exercised, and most importantly for this dangerous historical moment, how it might be lost. Now to understand our changing world and America's place in it, we must go back to basics, we must go back to the foundational text for the study of geopolitics. We must go all the way back to a bitter cold London evening in January 1904, when a man named Sir Halford Mackinder, who was then director of the London School of Economics, entranced an audience at the Royal Geographical Society on Seville Row in London with a paper boldly titled, The Geographical Pivot of History. McKinder argued that the future of global power lay not, as most British then imagined, in controlling the planet's sea lanes, but instead inside a vast landmass that he dubbed Euro-Asia. Now, in McKinder's view, when he was a geographer, Africa, Asia, and Europe were not three separate continents, but when you looked at them properly, they were a unitary landform, a single landmass that he dubbed the World Island and its broad, deep heartland, stretching for 4,000 miles from the Persian Gulf to the East Siberian Sea was so vast that it could only be controlled from its maritime marginal, he called it, in the surrounding seas. Quote, the discovery of the Cape Road to the Indies in the 16th century, McKinder explained, endowed Christendom with the widest possible mobility of power, wrapping her influence around the Euro-Asiatic land power, which had hitherto threatened her very existence. In the Victorian age, McKinder's age, the opening of the Suez Canal and the advent of steam shipping had, he said, quote, increased the mobility of the sea power relative to the land power, allowing, allowing the rise of Europe's vast empires in Asia and Africa. Now, as his audience that night in 1904 knew well, by then, the British Navy of 300 capital ships ruled the seas from a global network of 30, for, 30 fortified bastions stretching from Scapa Flow through Gibraltar all the way to the Straits of Malacca. But as the Trans-Siberian Railroad's single track was now crawling for 5,000 miles all the way from Mato Moscow to Vladivostok, the future railways could, McKinder warned, quote, work the greater wonder in the steppe undercutting the cost of sea transport and shifting the, the epicenter, the locus of geopolitical power away from the oceans where Britannia ruled the waves to the inland domain of the world island. Now, a century after Sir Halford Mackinder gave that speech, which by the way, was not just a 
a statement of the changing politics on the Eurasian landmass, that speech was actually the foundation of, of the study of geopolitics. Everybody that studies geopolitics, Zygmunt Brzezinski, everybody else since then, comes back to the single speech. That article was the invention of a discipline. <clears throat> a century after that historic speech in 1904, another British historian, Oxford historian John Darwin, argued in a sweeping history of empires in Eurasia over the span of a thousand years that the United States achieved what he called its colossal imperium on an unprecedented scale after World War II by becoming the first power in history to control what he called the strategic axial points at both ends of Eurasia and doing so through its military bases and mutual security pacts. Now while Washington defend the western end of Eurasia, that axial end in the west, through NATO, its position in the east was secured by four mutual defense pacts along the Pacific littoral from Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, all the way down to Australia. In the post-war architecture of US geopolitical power, these two axial points at the end of Eurasia were joined by an arc of steel around the continent comprising mutual defense treaties, strategic bombers, and naval armadas, specifically the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean, the Fifth Fleet in the Persian Gulf, and the Seventh Fleet in the Pacific. By the Cold War's end in 1990, the US encirclement of Eurasia required 700 overseas bases, 1,700 jet fighters, 1,000 ballistic missiles, and 600 ships, including 15 nuclear carrier battle groups, all linked by the world's only global system of telecommunication satellites. Most recently, in about the last 10 years, the US has added another layer to those circles of steel by building a string of 60 drone bases stretching around the Eurasian landmass from Sicily to Guam. In the decade after World War II as well, Washington also built a potent four-tier apparatus, military, diplomatic, economic, and clandestine, for a global dominion of unprecedented wealth and power. First and fundamental was the unmatched power of the US military. And complementing all that steel was the salve of a worldwide diplomacy, manifest in multilateral alliances, economic aid, and the cultural suasion of soft power, things like Hollywood movies and the Rotary, the Peace Corps, and all that. This global security also promoted trade pacts that allowed America's burgeoning multinational corporations to operate around the world profitably, and adding a distinct dimension to US global power that really distinguishes it from all empires past was a clandestine fourth tier that entailed global surveillance by the NSA, the National Security Administration, and covert operations on five continents by the CIA, manipulating elections and mobilizing client armies for coups to assure friendly leaders in presidential palaces worldwide. And after, after presiding over a <clears throat> world that has enjoyed 70 years of relative peace and prosperity, Washington, like any aging empire, is facing a slow erosion of power relative to other rising powers in almost every realm. Over the past half century, for example, the US share of the global economy has fallen from 40% in 1960 to just 22% in 1916. And if we use the more realistic measure, what's called purchasing power index, it's only about 15% of the world economy today. As its dominance of the world economy fades, the clandestine instruments that Washington once used to project its power so effectively are now weakening. <clears throat> the NSA's worldwide surveillance of select foreign leaders and their millions of citizens was once a cost-effective instrument for the exercise of global power. But now Edward Snowden's recent revelations about NSA snooping has raised that political cost. And right from the start of the Cold War, the CIA engaged in constant political intrigue frequent electoral manipulation, and occasional coups to assure that the leaders of the free world were friendly towards America. During the past decade, however, Washington's ability to shape the politics of other nations has faded, something we've seen in Venezuela, Nicaragua, Iran, and Georgia. For decades during the Cold War, Washington manipulated major elections worldwide with some success, but now Russia has used its cyber warfare to interfere in the 2016 US elections a clear sign of Washington waning global power. To put it very simply, very directly, a global hegemon manipulates other nations' elections. A fading superpower is manipulated. But above all, 
It is China's recent rise that has accelerated this process of U.S. decline. In 2012, at the seeming peak of U.S. global power, the National Intelligence Council, Washington's supreme analytic body, issued an unexpected warning about China's impending challenge. Let me quote from this important report, which was generally overlooked by the media. And the report says, quote, by 2030, no country will be a hegemonic power, largely reversing the historic rise of the West since 1750. Asia will have surpassed North America and Europe combined in terms of global power, based on gross domestic product, population size, military spending, and technological investment. China alone will probably have the largest economy, surpassing that of the United States a few years before 2030. Indeed, my book has collected a few all-important but often ignored indicators that reveal the full extent of China's contemporary challenge. In April 2015, the Department of Agriculture reported the U.S. economy would grow by nearly 50% over the next 15 years till 2030. But China's would expand by 300%, equaling or surpassing America's by 2030. Now as shown in the race for worldwide patents, American leadership in technological innovation is clearly on the wane. Back in 2008, not quite 10 years ago, the United States still held the number two spot behind Japan in worldwide patent applications with 232,000. China was at 195,000 and closing fast thanks to a blistering 400% increase in China's applications since the year 2000. By 2014, things were very, very different. China actually took the lead in this critical category. China scored nearly half the world's patent applications, filing an extraordinary 801,000 patent applications compared to just 285,000 for Americans. With supercomputing now critical for everything from code breaking to consumer products, in 2010, China's defense ministry beat the Pentagon by launching the world's fastest supercomputer, the Tianhe-1. For the next seven years, Beijing produced the world's fastest machine until 2016, it finally won in a way that really mattered with microchips made in China <coughs> itself. And by then, by 2016, China not only had the fastest supercomputers, but it also had the most in the world with 167 compared to 165 for the United States and only 29 for Japan, the number three. Finally, <clears throat> the American education system, a critical source of future scientists and engineers and innovators, has been falling behind its competitors. In 2012, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the rich countries club, if you will, tested 510,000 15-year-old students worldwide, finding those in Shanghai came first in math and science, while Americans placed 20th in science and 27 in math. Okay, we know that that was back then, but now we've had Bush's No Child Left Behind. We've had Obama's Race to the Top. Surely things must have gotten better. I wish I could say so. I'm an educator. That's what I do. In fact, things have gotten worse. Three years later, in 2015, America's standing slid further to 25th in science and, uh, this is not a typo, I looked it up, I double checked it, 39th in math. 39th in math, I mean, what? I mean, one can only imagine. Okay, so <laughs> you might say, all right, let's, let's forget that, okay? Why should any of us care about a bunch of 15-year-old kids with braces, backpacks, and okay, we know, attitude, right? Well. In 2030, those 15-year-old test, test takers will be the mid-career scientists and engineers determining whose computers survive a cyber attack, whose satellites avail a missile strike, and whose economy is going to have the next big best thing. After three years of abjuring any aspirations to world power, Beijing's actions over the past three years have revealed a subtle two-part strategy for challenging and defeating U.S. global hegemony. First, they're building a transcontinental engineering project of sufficient scale to realize Mackinder's original 1904 vision in that London lecture of harnessing the Eurasian heartland as an engine to drive the ascent of a new world power. 
And second, China is constructing naval bases for severing those circles of steel that Washington has long arrayed around the Eurasian continent's perimeter. Yet even today, a hundred years after Mackinder's lecture back in 1904, this Eurasian heartland is so vast, so empty, that its development represents a daunting challenge too difficult to grasp by a mere glance at the map. Now, let's face one fundamental fact, okay? You remember your middle school geography, right? Continents are sort of unitary, self-contained things, except there's one anomaly in, in that. Europe and Asia are actually a single landmass, okay? So, so we have one continent with two names, divided. And what was the division? The distance in that empty center, that heartland that Mackinder talked about. For nearly a thousand years from the 12th century to the 21st century, the endless distances alone challenge any traveler who tried to cross them, rendering Eurasia's actual geographical unity, in human terms, meaningless. Leaving Venice in about 1270 common era, Marco Polo became one of the first Europeans to travel overland to China, surviving bandits, sandstorms, and wilderness to complete the trek in three years. 600 years later, in 1907, another Italian aristocrat, Prince Scipione Borghese, won the very first Peking or Beijing to Paris auto race, driving his 40 horsepower Atala motor car for 60 days continuously to cover a distance of 9,000 miles and capture the prize fit for a prince, a magnum of mum's champagne. Now, when that auto race was commemorated a century later in 2007, my wife's Uncle David, uh, David Hope, very nice guy, a retired school teacher from Iowa who is a car fanatic, he joined the armada of 130 antique automobiles and he drove his lovingly restored Ford Coupe uh, on a journey that still took 36 days of continuous driving. Now, somewhere in the Gobi Desert, Uncle David became separated from the pack, and suddenly he found himself in the midst of this trackless terrain. No roads, no landmarks, no landforms, no nothing. He just was driving around and around, nothing but this empty, infinite, endless horizon. And he began to get really frightened. Now, relax. Uncle David didn't die in the Gobi Desert, okay? On the horizon, he spotted a little tiny speck of dust, and he figured, it's got to be the pack. It's the only thing moving in this whole terrain. And he, he hit the floor, and every one of those 90 horsepower kicked in, and he caught up. Now, just about the time Uncle David cleared that wasteland and was safely on his way across Russia on an actual road to Paris, the Chinese leadership in Beijing was making investment decisions that would change this landscape forever in ways that realize Mackinder's vision and represent a challenge to US dominion. Starting in around 2007, China launched the world's largest burst of infrastructure investment since Washington began building the interstate highway system back in the 1950s. In less than 10 years, China invested a trillion dollars in infrastructure to economically integrate this Eurasian landmass. Between 2007 and 2014, China built 9,000 miles of new high-speed rail, more than the rest of the world combined, and began integrating that domestic network into a transcontinental grid, starting with the so-called Eurasian land bridge. You can ship by train from China all the way to Germany. In this same dynamic decade, China began constructing a comprehensive network of transcontinental gas and oil pipelines to import fuels from Siberia and Central Asia, for its population centers in northern, central, and southern China. The result will soon be an integrated inland energy infrastructure, including Russia's own vast network of pipelines extending across the whole of the Eurasian landmass from the Atlantic for 6,000 miles all the way to the South China and East China Seas. Now, you remember the world island, three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Okay. China has got another trillion dollars to bring that one in as well. Recalling that Africa is the third component in Mackinder's imagined world island back in 1904, by 2015, Beijing had doubled its annual trade there to $220 billion, three times America's, and China plans to invest a, a trillion dollars by 2025 that will make it the absolutely dominant economic power on the African continent, binding it into that world island. And indeed, to bind that world island's finances together, 
In 2016, Beijing launched the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that attracted 57 member nations, including a number of America's closest allies, who together contributed $100 billion in capital, making this new institution half the size of the World Bank. In a complementary move, China's building Navy bases in the Arabian and South China Seas. In April 2015, President Xi Jinping committed $46 billion to build the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that will stretch for 2,000 miles from China's west to a joint port facility at Gwadar, Pakistan. There, China had already spent $200 billion to transform this sleepy fishing village into a modern strategic port just 370 miles from the mouth of the Persian Gulf. Just last year, in 2016, Beijing began building a major naval base at Djibouti on the Horn of Africa, creating the basis for permanent Chinese naval deployments in the energy-rich Arabian Sea. Starting in two, April 2014, Beijing escalated its claim to exclusive control over the South China Sea, expanding its Longpo naval base on Hainan Island in southern China to build the region's first nuclear submarine facility since the United States pulled out of Subic Bay in 1991, and dredging seven artificial atolls to construct military airfields in the Spratly Islands right in the middle of the South China Sea. By 2030, China will have so many aircraft carriers in the area that the South China Sea will become what the Pentagon has called a Chinese lake. With its naval bases spanning 5,000 miles across the Arabian and South China Seas, while its submarines range as far as San Diego, <coughs> China is forging a future capacity to strategically cut through those arcs of steel that America has long laid down around the Eurasian landmass. So, what has Washington done about all this? Have we been asleep at the switch? Has anybody been paying attention? Am I making this all up? <coughs> well, upon taking office in 2009, the Obama administration, and President Obama is one of the very few American leaders that has a keen sense of geopolitics, developed a sophisticated two-part strategy to contain China's rise. First and fundamentally, the Obama White House negotiated two ambitious trade pacts, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, that would effectively drain the commercial lifeblood out of China's imagined world island, okay, across the Pacific towards America, across the Atlantic towards America. 60% of world trade in these two pacts would be redirected from Eurasia towards America. Second, Obama decided that the Middle East was a strategic dead end for America. Now that we were energy independent, we had no real strategic interest in the Middle East. And he began shifting every possible spare force out of the Middle East to rebuild America's axial position along the Pacific littoral from Japan through the Philippines to Australia. Now after President Obama announced what he called his pivot to Asia in a 2011 address to the Australian par Parliament, a full battalion of U.S. Marines was deployed in March 2014 at Darwin on the Timor Sea, well positioned to access the South China Sea through Indonesia's sea lanes. In 2014, the Philippines, angry with China over Beijing's seizure of Scarborough Shoal, a atoll well within Philippine uh, 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 maritime waters, the Philippines allowed the stationing of U.S. forces at five military bases close to the South China Sea. And through existing bases in Japan and Okinawa, construction of a joint naval facility on Jeju Island in South Korea, and access to naval bases in Subic, Singapore, and Darwin, Washington under Obama quickly rebuilt its chain of military enclaves all along the Pacific littoral. And under Obama, to operate these installations, the Pentagon planned to, to quote, forward base 60% of our naval assets in the Pacific by 2020, along with similar preponderance of Air Force fighters and bombers. Under Obama, as well, the US Naval Navy regularly and repeatedly challenged China's claim to the South China Sea with what were called freedom of navigation patrols, massive carrier armadas sailing through the South China Sea to make it clear to China that these were international waters. Now, in his first year in office, the Trump White House has done a remarkable job 
of demolishing the pillars of US global power. During his first overseas trip in May, President Trump chastised stone-faced NATO leaders for their failure to pay their, quote, fair share into the military part of the alliance. And then, very significantly, he refused to affirm before the NATO members the core principle of collective defense, i.e., one NATO member is attacked, all the other NATO members will come to their defense. He pointedly refused to affirm it. He's since made gestures in that division in direction, but, but at the time, that was a very serious blow. That prompted Angela Merkel to declare Europe must mind its own destiny. Along the strategic Pacific littoral, the other axial end of the Eurasian landmass, Trump canceled the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact right upon taking office. Uh, this prompted Japan, particularly Prime Minister Abe, to warn that China, through its regional cooperation 16-nation trade pact, would soon capture all the commerce. Uh, Abe pleaded, he called, he was the first leader to call Trump. The point of that phone call was to plead with Trump to pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He flew to Trump Tower, sat down with Donald and Ivanka. Again, the topic of that 90-minute conversation was Abe's plea. Trump blew it off and canceled the trade pact. Under Trump, America's once close relations with its four key allies along the Pacific littoral have weakened visibly. During his courtesy phone call upon taking office, Trump gratuitously insulted Australia's Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, increasing the country's mounting inclination to shift Australia's primary strategic alliance towards China. In recent public opinion polls, 45% of all Australians said that they preferred China over America as a primary ally. This is an unimaginable breach uh, that Trump's policy is only widening. <coughs> During his campaign, in his first months in office, uh, Trump insulted South Korea to the point where its new president won office in large part on a platform of, quote, say no to America. And when that president, Moon Jae-in, visited Washington this June, determined to heal the breach between the two countries, he was blindsided by the harshness of Trump's critique of the South Korea-U.S. free trade pact. And just days after Trump dismissed President Moon's suggestion that the two countries negotiate with North Korea, Pyongyang successfully test-fired a ballistic missile capable of reaching Alaska or possibly Hawaii with a nuclear warhead, an act that made those same negotiations Washington's only viable option, apart from a devastating, perhaps, nuclear war. Now, in the Philippines, because we're moving down country by country, Japan, South Korea, right down the Pacific littoral, in the Philippines, the inauguration of President Rodrigo Duterte in June of last year brought a sudden shift in the country's foreign policy, ending his country's opposition to Beijing's bases in the South China Sea and allying openly with China. Now, despite good personal relations between these two leaders, who are very much in that right-wing populist vein that we've seen emerging right around the planet in recent years, the leaked transcript of President Trump's phone call to President Duterte last April about the North Korean nuclear threat indicates how far, how far the Philippines has tilted towards China. Now, I could read the transcript off verbatim, and it would, I don't think, mean that much. The words are pretty dull on the page. So let's spice it up. If we change Trump's words to accentuate their kind of middle school swagger, and then we keep President Duterte's text absolutely verbatim, as it was in the transcript, then I think the subtext, the real meaning of the text, would read like this, okay? So Trump says, hey, Rodrigo, baby, I got the cyber power to keep them North Korean trash rockets crashing. But President Duterte replies, quote, the ace card has to be with China. So Trump ramps it up, insisting, no, man, I got two killer nuclear subs right there, right now. Trump actually said that. But Duterte replies, I will call President Xi Jinping. And then Donnie Boy plays his trump card saying, no way, man, because I got 20 times the nuclear blast of that Pyongyang punk, so I can smoke Mr. Rocket Man's ugly butt right to kingdom come. Duterte to that replies, quote, he will make a call tomorrow to China. So bye-bye, Manila. A hundred years of a close relationship, basically gone. In the war of nerves with North Korea over its missile tests, 
Trump's strategy of triangulation with China, we lean on Beijing to lean on Pyongyang to stop the rockets. Nobody in Washington s seems to notice that we've already, in a certain sense, lost the real diplomatic game. Washington has suspended all freedom of navigation patrols in the South China Sea for the last three months, effectively conceding the strategic waterway, which is the, the passage for $5 trillion of global trade, one of the most critical arteries for global trade anywhere on the planet, conceding this waterway effectively to China. Stretch to the breaking point by the standoff with China. As we all know, four ships of the U.S. 7th Fleet have recently crashed two with heavy casualties killing 17 American seamen, while China's Navy pushing calmly, relentlessly, aggressively against Washington's seawall of containment has had zero accidents. In other words, America's geopolitical command of the axial ends of Eurasia, the central pillars of its world power for the past 70 years, seems to be crumbling with surprising speed. Now, <clears throat> What do we make of all this? If we look into the future a bit, what can we see? And here we go beyond documented fact into applying that fact into constructing scenarios, possibilities, things that might happen. First and fundamentally, even the mightiest of empires is surprisingly fragile, vulnerable to sudden collapse from unforeseen causes. Who could have guessed at the end of World War II that the British Empire that had covered half the globe for over 200 years would be gone in less than 20 years? Or who could have guessed that the ferocious Soviet bloc would collapse in just two years? So I projected four scenarios for the end of US global power by 2030 in the expectation that actual events would combine elements of each in ways that nobody could imagine. Now at the most benign level, one of my scenarios, the tides of geopolitical power flow towards Beijing, the US military slowly retreats from the whole of Eurasia, and Washington becomes just one of several major powers. More malign would be an American version of the British bumbler, Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden, either Trump or some inept successor, blundering into an ill-conceived military strike akin to Britain's 1956 invasion of the Suez Canal, that exposes the limits of American power, just as British power was exposed back in 1956. Or we could see a continuing decline in the US share of the global economy. It was 40% in 1960. It's down to 22% or maybe even 15% today, and it's dropping steadily. This could reduce Washington's ability to project its military power globally. By 2040, a little beyond my 2030 scenario, the crushing costs of climate change, which by the way, I've read the reports, nobody in Washington has actually added up what this is gonna cost. Uh, uh, this, I think, will redirect that 5% of US gross domestic product, domestic product used for imperial defense to domestic recovery, forcing the US military to retreat from its global bases. But more dramatically, there could be what I call World War III with China, that America, according to recent Pentagon assessments, just might not win. So of the five scenarios for the eclipse of US global power in my book, let me pick just one, the one that's the most dramatic, the one that's the most fun, World War III with China. So let's all imagine, and again, remember, this is just imagination. You, know, you could come up with your own scenario. You could punch holes in this one, but let's just imagine that it's 11.59 p.m. on a Thanksgiving Thursday in 2030. 13 years from now. Uh, for months, tensions have been mounting between the Chinese and US Navy patrols in the South China Sea. With the American economy diminished, Washington plays the last card in an extremely and increasingly weak hand, deploying six of its remaining eight carrier groups to the Western Pacific. Instead of intimidating China's leaders, the move makes them more bellicose. Uh, they send frigates to play chicken with two of the U.S. aircraft carriers on patrol, crossing ever closer beneath their bows. And then tragedy strikes. Now back during the Vietnam War in 1967, this actually happened. The U.S. destroyer Frank Evans steered in front of the bow of the oncoming Australian aircraft carrier, the HMAS Melbourne, 
and the HMAS Melbourne sliced through the Frank Evans, and, and it, it sent 70 American sailors, including one of my college classmates, to their death, and their bodies are still beneath the South China Sea, and there's a memorial to them in Nebraska. They didn't get their names on the Vietnam War Memorial because it wasn't deemed to be directly war-related. So, just miles away from where that tragic accident once occurred, at 4 a.m. on a foggy October night, the massive carrier USS Gerald Ford slices through the aging frigate Zuchang, sinking the Chinese ship with its entire crew of 165. Beijing demands an apology. Beijing demands reparations. But Washington, as it always does, refuses. China's fury comes fast. At the stroke of midnight on Black Friday of 2030, U.S. Air Force technicians at the Cyber Command Operations Center in Texas detect malicious binaries that show the distinctive digital fingerprints of China's People's Liberation Army. In what historians will later call the Battle of the Binaries, the Cybercom's supercomputers launch their killer countercodes, but Beijing's quantum satellite system, equipped as it is actually today being equipped, with super-secure photon transmission proves impervious to hacking. Meanwhile, an armada of bigger, faster supercomputers, slave to Shanghai's Cyber Warfare Command, blast backs with impenetrable logarithms of unprecedented sophistication, slipping into the US satellite system through its antiquated microwave signals. The first blow was one nobody expected. Flying at 60,000 feet above the South China Sea, Several U.S. carrier base MQ-25 Stingray drones, infected by Chinese malware, suddenly fire all the pods beneath their enormous delta wingspans, sending dozens of lethal missiles plunging harmlessly into the waves below. Now, after the White House authorizes a retaliatory strike, Air Force commanders in California transmit robotic codes to a flotilla of X-37 space drones orbiting 250 miles above the Earth. We actually have, have two of them now. We'll, there'll be only more. Uh, and these signals tell the space drones to launch their triple terminator missiles at several of China's communication satellites. Suddenly, unexpectedly, zero response. The, the X-37B drones do not respond. As Beijing's viruses spread uncontrollably through the US satellite architecture, GPS, global positioning signals crucial to the navigation of America's ships and aircraft worldwide are suddenly and seriously compromised. Across the Pacific, naval deck, desk, deck officers finding that they, they don't know where they are. They can't navigate. The GPS doesn't work. They're blind in the middle of ocean with no boundaries. They recall that at Annapolis as cadets, as midshipmen, they had to take uh, astral navigation. And they reach for their sectants and they start steering by steering by sun and stars as they abandon their stations off the China coast and steam for the safety of Hawaii. An angry American president decides that it's time to get serious and orders a retaliatory strike on a secondary Chinese target, Longpo nuclear submarine base on China's southern Hainan Island. But mid-flight, the X-51 Wave Rider hypersonic missiles flying at 4,000 miles an hour suddenly unexpectedly nosedive into the Pacific. Almost immediately, Beijing, angry that its territory would be attacked, launches dozens of missiles, no longer cyber war, but actual war, for strikes on key American communication satellites, scoring a high ratio of kinetic kills on these hulking units. Suddenly, dozens of American F-35 pilots already airborne are blinded as their helmet-mounted avionic displays go black, unable to, to go, fly, to navigate, to know where they are. They have to come down to 10,000 feet so they can see mountains and roads and coastlines and fly, follow those landforms back to base like bus drivers in the sky. Mid-flight on regular patrols around the Eurasian landmass, two dozen of the CIA's super-secret advanced RQ-180 surveillance drones suddenly lose control and they fly aimlessly toward the horizon, crashing when their fuel is exhausted. With surprising speed, the United States lose control of what its Air Force had long called the ultimate strategic high ground, space. Now, with intelligence flooding the Kremlin about crippled American capacity, Moscow, still in 2030, a close Chinese ally, sends 
a dozen nuclear submarines beyond the Arctic Circle to take up permanent provocative patrols between New York and Newport News. Meanwhile, half a dozen missile frigates from Russia's Black Sea Fleet steam for the Western Mediterranean to shadow and harass the U.S. Sixth Fleet. Within a matter of hours, and without any significant casualties, Washington's strategic gra grip on the axial ends of Eurasia, the keystone to its global dominion for the past 85 years is broken, and the American century of global hegemony is over. Now, <clears throat> no methodology and no scenario, no matter how fun it might be, can possibly encompass the many moving parts of a world empire, much less the ever-changing interactions among several of these massive behemoths. But with that caveat, that it's very difficult to know and, and even more difficult to project, I feel we are clearly at the start of a major transition away from unchecked, untrammeled US hegemony. After a quarter century as the world's sole superpower, Washington now faces an adversary which, as we saw in Beijing in the party conference, Xi Jinping is determined to mount a sustained challenge to US dominion. He is determined militarily and economically to establish China as the world's great power. Now, there are naysayers who insist, and there's lots of contemporary scholars that are writing in, in erudite journals arguing that this is never going to happen. They insist that China's population is restive, its demographics are declining, they're aging, or its economy has weak fundamentals. But in my view, they're missing the main point. Once Asia, Africa, and Latin America merge into that world island through China's trillion or maybe two trillion dollar infrastructure project with Beijing at its center, the tides of trade and geopolitical power will, as if by natural law, flow away from Washington and towards Beijing. And even if Beijing falters, thanks to a decline in economic growth or a surge in popular discontent or other factors that we can't even imagine right now, <clears throat> there are still a dozen rising powers worldwide working to build a multipolar world beyond the grasp of any single global hegemon. If the world experiences a slow, peaceful transition away from US hegemony, then the subsequent world order just might, just might, maintain the liberal international institutions like the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the International Criminal Court, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, that in a sense represent the best of American values, the best possible American legacy from its 70 or 80 years of global dominion. If by contrast the world experiences the rise of Chinese or Russian hegemony, then we're likely witness a harsher world order based on rail politic and crude commercial advantage with scant attention to human rights, women's rights, gay rights, and the rule of law. And whether this will be a peaceable transition akin to the amicable imperial handover from Britain to America in the 1950s, or a violent eruption like the Napoleonic Wars, World War I or World War II, we can't say, but nonetheless, this ongoing shift in the balance of power certainly bears watching. From everything I've learned since I started graduate school nearly 15 years ago, I think we can count on one thing. This transition will be transformative, even traumatically so, impacting upon the fabric of life for almost every American. Thank you. The, the question is very simply, I repeat for the, uh, the person taping, the question is very simply, what are the stakes in the clash with over North Korea? What's China's hand? What's the US hand? What's going on? Uh, if we use, a, I think, a common metaphor, because we're looking at basically a point in geopolitics when it comes down to three leaders, okay, uh, in Beijing, Pyongyang, and Washington. And so what we're looking at one of those moments in which global diplomacy particularly nuclear arm global diplomacy, has all that game theory. So let's use the, the game of poker, okay? Uh, uh, Xi Jinping is playing a masterful game. You know, he's not showing his cards. Uh, you know, he's playing a very long, strong hand. And, and frankly, you know, uh, 
I don't think he's terribly concerned that Kim Jong-un is actually going to use a nuclear weapon. Uh, I, I don't think he wants the regime to fall. That's very clear. China does not want the flood of several million Koreans into northeastern China, which would really strain their economy, resources beyond imagining. I think China likes the situation just as it is. And I think China is playing upon this situation brilliantly. Um, in my own view, it's already over. China's won, we've lost. Xi Jinping, a cool poker player, playing a long hand against an impulsive guy who's throwing the chips on the table and pounding and you know calling and raising and trying to bluff and bluster. He's just sitting there, not showing his hand, beating Trump at every move. And the China's game, I think, is not concerned with Northeast Asia. What China wants is the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And China's getting both of them. So in China's, it's in China's interest to let this crisis drag on for months or years. And, in the, and, and, and then for, for Washington to think it's pressuring Beijing to pressure Pyongyang to stop the missile tests. And, and as long as that game is going on, China's winning because the US Navy is backed right out of the South China Sea. And every month that we don't run a freedom of information control effectively transfers de facto sovereignty over that critical body of water to China. And so China's winning this game, hands down. There's no real risk for China. I'm sure they've done an accurate assessment. They don't really feel there's a serious risk of thermonuclear war. They probably have pretty good intelligence about how the missile program is going, the weaknesses of it, the strengths of it. The other thing that's, I think, fraught with risk for the United States, okay, so what are the US options? Okay, well, uh, I mean, Steve Bannon, probably not my favorite geopolitical strategist, but nonetheless, Steve Bannon had a blinding flash of insight just before he left, he called up uh, some liberal reporter in Washington, D.C. and said, you know, basically all this stuff with uh, Pyongyang is nonsense because, you know, we can't do anything to them because they're just going to shell Seoul where 10 million people can get killed. So they've got us. So it's just not, he said, it's just, we can't, we can't do anything. All right. <clears throat> uh, so, so, you know, one, we are very limited in our capacity for action. So what can we do? We can't, I think, strike at North Korea. Realistically, the military recoil from that because they've got massive amounts of artillery that we can't even begin to knock out quickly enough to stop them from shelling Seoul. It's an, I don't know if you've been to Seoul, I've been there. It's a densely packed city with elaborate infrastructure, high rise. I mean, shelling would, it would be, uh, it would be disastrous. The death would be phenomenal. The damage to South Korea's economy, and South Korea's got an economy bigger than Russia's. It's the 12th, 11th or 12th biggest economy in the world, and it's very important technologically. So there'd be all kinds of ramifications for that damage. So I don't think they're gonna do that. So what's the Trump administration gonna do? Okay, so he keeps testing missiles. So he, I think the logical thing to do without getting into that disastrous circumstance is to try and launch an anti-missile to knock down one of his missiles. And that's got real risk because eh, the Pentagon always rigs the tests, so we don't know if they actually work. So if we fire an anti-missile and it misses, that's it. You know? Japan then will say, we're gonna build our own nuclear capacity. The, the US anti-missile shield is not a real shield. We need to either build any missiles or maybe even go full nuclear. Uh, South Korea will pull away. That's it. You know, that'll be the equivalent, you know, in a very limited sense of what happened at Suez in 1956 with the British, where, you know, Britain in the 1950s was managing their imperial retreat very skillfully. They had full unemployment. The economy is doing well. The pound was the world's global reserve currency, and bang, you know, they sent, they, they colluded, they plotted secretly with the Israelis and the French. They sent six aircraft carriers, 300,000 men. They stormed through the Suez Canal, and the IMF had to do the first bailout of an economy. It wasn't done for Mexico or, you know, it was done for the United Kingdom, the first bailout in the history of the IMF to stop the pound from collapsing because it was a global reserve currency. It was unsustainable because of being ruined by the cost of this abortive military intervention. And from that time onward, the mighty British lion became a kind of circus animal that would roll over whenever Washington cracked the whip. So you can overplay your military hand. 
And that's what I think the likely result would be in this circumstance. Yes, sir. Um, I was very much taken by the beginning of your book, the first paragraph, about having been born in 1945, and for your whole life, America was in wars, long wars, short wars, cold war wars, and so forth. I was also born in 1945, so my experience is the same as yours. I was, in fact, also at Columbia in six years. So I'd be curious what building you were in. But as I listened to you retelling the story of these 70 years, I, I kept uh, trying to think how I would reframe it and, and, and see it somewhat differently. So if you would indulge me for a moment, I, uh, I, would, I would try to kind of uh, look at essentially the, the, uh, the change between the mid 1945 and the mid 70s, and from the 70s to now, and I, I thought I'd look at it in the, in the way you talked about the race to the top and uh, all of these ridiculous uh, programs in schools. If you go back and think about the response to Sputnik in the 50s, and uh, how that did in fact uh, uh, spark a very very successful attempt to. Uh, uh, create a lot of scientists, put new math in school, have national foundation science programs where people go to summer camps in the summer and learn what they would use in college. I mean, it had a real effect. Uh, and you can say at that time that the national security apparatus and the educational apparatus in the country were aligned. This was a Keynesian period, right? And, and the people who were running at the Eastern establishment, the uh, people who had uh, served in the OSS and then were in the CIA afterwards who went all, to all the good Eastern prep schools. Uh, the best and the brightest, the ones who were going to meet their downfall in the Vietnam War, had at least, were on the same page as the people who were running General Motors and one of whom became, after ran the Pentagon. But what we had after the mid-70s, 80s with Reagan, is we had a split between, let's say, neoconservative and neo neoliberalism. The new conservatives essentially were the people who wanted to continue playing the great game in their kind of hyperbolic, uh, muscular fashion, almost a parody of the early, uh, you know, they essentially wanted to be, uh, to have an empire and to have, uh, and to fight everywhere. Neoliberals essentially were about making the world free for capital to go everywhere that it could, knocking down them barriers to capital control and so forth, even putting their money uh, in uh, islands around the world and, and not worrying about what happened to the larger society, feeling that they were closer to the larger class of businessmen that they dealt with around the world rather than to their own country. So we have this very, very strange moment now where China seems to be uh, embodying this kind of Keynesian capitalism that we had uh, in the 40s and 50s, where they're building infrastructure the way we built the gigantic uh, highway systems and so forth. Uh, they're trying to be essentially a, a sort of good social type of capitalist, where on one side we see the national security establishment following its own impulses, which are pretty much the same from the time of the kinder to now, sort of looking at the map as uh, a globe where there are, there are dominoes or powers that are recognizing and trying to make counter moves. And we have the economic uh, part of society that is oriented to something that's totally different. And, and they're, they're, not, uh, uh, they're not in sync. Now, the, the, the thing I would like to maintain, however, being a 60s person, is that both efforts at foreign policy in America failed. And the uh, Eastern establishment went its Waterloo, but I picked the word 19, year 1973, both in Vietnam and in Chile, which for, for another reason I'll say. Which is in Vietnam, it's a case where everything was conceived in terms of game theory and counter moves and so forth. And yet it was totally inadequate to the forces that they were fighting and in appreciating what, what, who the enemy was, what they wanted, what a decolonization movement meant in the world and so forth. So it found itself essentially 
following all its geopolitical imperatives that seem to be right, but foundering them now, and, and being left bereft of answers in the 70s before these new groups, the cowboys from the south and so forth, came in, and foreign policy took another direction. So in a way, what I find strange when I listen to you is there's almost a nostalgia for this first group that's disappeared, the ones who went to prep school and at least had a sense of uh, geopolitics from a kinder, uh, where it seems, there seems to be, you seem to forget that these, they failed too, to uh, respond adequately to a world which is developing in different directions. Am I being uh, unfair in, in framing it that way? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you're, I think you're absolutely correct in saying that uh, there's an interrelationship between the U.S. economic growth, the structuring of domestic society and what we choose to invest in, uh, the, 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 the quality of leadership, the people that are running the decisions they make. So let's just, let's just look at three critical periods that you, you focused on. First of all, after World War II. Uh, what's really surprising when you go through and you read the, the minutes of the U.S. National Security Council, in the 1950s, particularly under Eisenhower, is the self-conscious sophistication of the world system that they're building and running. Right. Yeah, they, they really know what they're doing. And they gotta remember that these are an extraordinary generation. They emerged not only, Eisenhower himself was trained at West Point. Uh, he you know, served in the Philippines, built an entire army in the Philippines uh, from the ground up, came to Washington, went, became chief commander, and he had you know, an army of probably 10 million men, maybe more, 10, 12 million men under his command. And it gave him, you know, an extraordinary kind of vision that we can't even begin to imagine. You know, when you, when you see the world arrayed before you, have that kind of power and you, you deploy it. And what's interesting is that Eisenhower actually used that insight and judgment to be a very skilled leader of, of a global empire. Uh, during, during his time in office, there were 60 new nations, okay? That was the first wave of decolonization. He was having to deal with the fact that the world had been organized with six empires controlling most of the world. Britain, through formal and informal empire, at its peak in the 1890s, had 50% of the world under its direct control. Suddenly we go from six empires to 100 new nations. Eisenhower is very much aware of it, and he skillfully uses the CIA, which is failing its mission of pe penetrating the communist bloc. He redeploys them. He uses the National Security Council as kind of staff studies. They have regular meetings. They discuss what's going on in Latin America, what's going on in Asia, who are leaders, how, what's economic change. They're, they're, they're really watching the world. They're gaming it. And then he's using the CIA, I think he, CIA under Eisenhower did 170 covert operations, of which we only know a dozen or so. All right. So he, was, he deployed them as his kind of shadow army, dealing with something he was very clever at understanding, that the old imperial age where you could intervene directly were no longer working because the new world order the United States had presided over um, had, was a world order of sovereign nations whose territorial sovereignty was inviolable. So how do you intervene and exercise asymmetric power in a world in which there isn't supposed to be asymmetric power? It's a world of equal sovereign nations, the CIA, covert operations. Eisenhower took that instrument and he turned it into a very deft instrument for manipulating and trying to control that world. So Chile that you saw was the ultimate logic of that. They, they, had, they started that in the 50s under Eisenhower they, they, they built upon that. The events of 73 were a culmination of 15 years of continuous intervention. I was there. No, oh, no. Okay. Uh, but okay, me, the, okay, go, okay, so, you know, Eisenhower had that. Okay, miscalculation in Vietnam. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Eisenhower, it's, it's very important to realize that when the Suez crisis happened, you know, Sir Anthony Eden kept Eisenhower in there. That's great. Yep. He understood it exactly. He understood nationalism. He understood. It. He made a mistake with the Aswan Dam, cutting off the finances and pushing Egypt into the hands of the Russians for potential finance. But he was brilliant in staying out of that and realizing that this was a disaster, and then playing upon it as he did in the Iran coup as well. 
know, he did that with British intelligence, but then US oil companies got all the, the Anglo-Iranian oil company, BP, got frozen right out. American oil companies grabbed it all after that joint operation. He was brilliant because he was working with his British comrades from World War II, people he lived with, partied with, drank with. He knew them intimately. He understood their weakness. He played them brilliantly, and he stole away their empire so cleverly that they didn't realize their pockets had been picked by the time that it was done. All right, now, <laughs> his successors. Uh, Vietnam was a gross strategic miscalculation. Uh, and to, to do this, I always go back to Eisenhower, okay? At the, <clears throat> when Eisenhower uh, was a, a planner in, inside the War Department, uh, the Battle of Bataan had been fought, MacArthur had left, and he had gone to Australia and he was mobilizing an army to, to, to return to the Philippines. It was very dramatic. This was one of the greatest US defeats in US military history. The United States Army in the Far East was crushed. The Asiatic fleet was sunk to the bottom of the Java Sea. We, the US has never lost a fleet and an army before. We lost both before the Japanese. There was enormous pressure you know, on the War Department to, sh to take resources away from the European theater and shunt them to the Southwest Pacific theater. Eisenhower did a simple strategic calculus. He said, <clears throat> if we win the Southwest Pacific area, which is MacArthur's command in Australia, we do not win World War II. If we lose the Southwest Pacific area, okay, we do not lose World War II. Therefore, this is a strategic in consequence. It's a third tier theater. Give them as little as you can you get away with. Well, during the Vietnam War, there was nobody exercising that kind of geopolitical judgment. Did we lose the Vietnam War? Yes, most definitively. Did we win the Cold War? Yes. So clearly, it was a gross miscalculation that ripped the US Army to pieces for 10 years. They were absolutely incapable of mounting operations, divided the society, crippled the political consensus the US needed, okay? You know, and then as we move on with each generation beyond that founding generation that built this imperium and maintained it skillfully, they seem to forget what the dynamics of this apparatus are. And what we're seeing with Donald Trump is, you know, he's sitting there with, you know, these generals. I don't think any of them understand the, the, the geopolitics of what they're doing. Now, one thing that's really striking about Obama is that he did. I regard Obama as something of a geopolitical genius. He was incredibly skillful in managing the resources of a declining power in order to maximize its influence, slow that decline, and maintain its global position. Trump has served as a demolition job, and he's just, uh, he's accelerating the decline every day. So one thing that emerges through all of this, okay, is one, there are complex long-term systemic variables. Social capital, a share of the global economy, technological edge. But then, very importantly in this game of empires, leadership matters. Leaders can slow decline, accelerate it, maximize opportunities, uh, minimize losses, or quite the opposite. And so at each three phases, we're seeing those variables playing out. You've got to remember, throughout this period that we're describing, the United States after World War II had about 50% of the world economy. By 1960, we're 40. Down, we're down to 20 or maybe 15. So in effect, back in the 50s, that golden age that you described, when I went to those great schools, got my polio vaccines, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera, that we all did, you know, uh, you know, we could both have guns and butter. We could have this massive military apparatus around the globe, and we had sufficient funds for domestic prosperity. We were, had half the world's economy in this little tiny country, all right? Well, it's diminished, and now we have to make choices. We can't do it all like we once did. So what we've been doing is maintaining the foreign apparatus and beggaring the domestic infrastructure, including intellectual, and the decline is showing. It's, you know, those chickens are slowly coming home to roost. And what's happening is, is cascading mistakes. We're, and, you know, and this can either be slow erosion or it can have dramatic eruptions. And that's what the future will tell. Other questions? Yep, Ed. So uh, this whole uh, global empire has always been based on control of the oil. And you're talking about uh, how China is building all these pipelines with Russia and all over the place. And the thing is that uh, if we're going to survive on this planet, you know, oil has to end, you know, because we have to get some other kind of, uh, you know, uh, energy. You know, so uh, how does that fit into the equation? It looks like China is still, they're all still focused on controlling the oil. If 
China's a 21st century power running an 18th century energy system based on, on dirty coal, okay? And, and those pipelines are bringing not just oil, but mainly get natural gas. So China is making a massive switch in its plants, and it's a, it's a struggle just like our struggle because the coal industry has got local influence, creates lots of jobs in China, much more than the United States. <clears throat> so he's got to weigh that, but, but he's, he's presiding over a forced transition in China's in energy infrastructure from coal to gas. Furthermore, he's decided that China is going to become the world leader in alternative energy sources, in solar panels and wind turbines, and they're purloining technology from around the globe, developing massive alternative energies. So he's really moving China very rapidly through a two-phase development, shifting from coal to natural gas, so that, that those choking, crippling fogs that blacken the sky at noon in Beijing will disappear, as they will with natural gas, but then the emissions will drop dramatically when they, they switch to renewables. Renewables. So China has actually got a, you know, a, a serious commitment to the Paris Climate Accord. They haven't dropped out. They're going to comply, and they're going to profit accordingly. So that, you know, it's, it's a very skillful strategy. Uh, <clears throat> and it's one of those advantages when you're trying to shift your energy infrastructure uh, where a command economy has advantages, when you have to make a rapid shift, okay, right across the board, and you've got all these competing forces, the, the antecedent in industries that are pushing, the, the carbon lobby is pushing to maintain coal and oil, and having a command economy gives China a certain advantage that a free market economy doesn't have, where we have a freer interplay of forces, and the lobbyists can win time and again. Okay, so the three-part question. First of all, is the U.S. empire short-lived? And second of all, um, what are the dynamics that's going to allow some kind of, if I could get your second question, I think, some kind of transition to be more effective? What's, what's the nature of that transition going to be? Okay, the first part about that, that I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the second part because when you start saying the U.S. empire is short-lived, I start doing numbers in my head and start saying, okay, so has it really been short-lived? Okay, well, if let's say we last to 2030, uh, that will have been 85 years. Uh, the, <clears throat> the Soviet Union was 1917 to 1990, which is uh, 63 years. Uh, uh, Germany, which had one of the few empires that actually controlled the European continent, that lasted six years. Japan, <clears throat> which by my counting, had the world's biggest empire in terms of population under its control because they conquered much of China. And of course, you know, you, you, the numbers are difficult to add up, but I think Japan may have had what is the biggest empire in human history in terms of the number of people under its control. It's also one of the quickest empires. It only lasted, you know, at its peak, two and a half years. Okay, so, so 85 years in the imperial game, that's not bad. And they got to remember the British Empire at its peak, 1815 Waterloo to 1914, you know, to the start of World War I, 99 years. You know, and, and they had 99 years as, as premier global power, you know, contending powers, but nonetheless. So 85 years, that's pretty close to Great Britain. That's not bad. You know, in the, in the arena of empires, that's good. Yes? But in the 60s, a big factor for us was the contrast between the notion of empire and the notion of democracy, and the idea that they were, they were incompatible. Uh, I respect Eisenhower tremendously. He may be the last president that I find anything really good uh, to say about. Uh, uh, the way he essentially helped to dismantle the British Empire, which uh, Roosevelt had started, with Churchill by being a better negotiator, and the way all American servicemen in World War II felt a certain disgust when they saw the actual British Empire in India and, and, and thought of themselves as American as representing something else than the old empire. Uh, and so when Eisenhower intervenes in Suez against those empires in line with what America's new role as a, a beacon of democracy to the third world is, 
one has to feel joy at that direction which is never followed up. At the same time, when one looks at what's going on underneath, and I used to uh, assign this to Dulles and that sort of theological anti-communism, when you look at the coups against Mossadegh in Iran and Arbenz in Guatemala, you see uh, uh, chains of events that are set in motion that are going to rebound back in a way that ultimately hurts us immensely. Che Guevara happens to be a visitor in uh, Guatemala during the coup and observe it. And so the notion that America will in any way be some sort of beacon of democracy in Latin America starts to become uh, uh, something highly dubious if it wasn't before for many years of interventions in Central America. Uh, and that ultimately plays itself out in Chile, which to Americans who are 18 or 20 or learning about their country, seeing essentially a democracy that is destroyed by intense American intervention doesn't square with our notion of what we are ourselves. So it's where empire and democracy uh, seem to be alternatives as to what we are, as in fact they presented themselves in Vietnam. So, you know, at times when I hear you talk about some people having skillfully played the empire game as opposed to Trump or idiots or other, other people or Bush or so forth, I mean, sure, they played that game better, but there was a limitation to that game itself. Uh, can, I, can I respond? Yeah. I, I think <clears throat> it's, it, it's, you're, it's a very provocative and very useful kind of question. Okay, this, this tension in the United States between the principles of democracy that we're espousing, which define us as a world leader, that makes us this exceptional nation, this exceptional power, freed from the curse of colonialism and imperialism. And, and then the reality of the fact that we're presiding over a global order and we're intervening in nations around the globe covertly and overthrowing their sovereign states, in a sense betraying the sovereign order that we've constructed. And I think that, how could I put it? Every empire, empires are, are odd confections that fuse together all kinds of seemingly and actually contradictory principles and practice in their, in their sum. And they're, they're held together in a way that nation states aren't because they're kind of diverse and they, they, they're, they're doing multiple things that nation states don't really do. World powers are maintaining geopolitical positions. They're maximizing their influence. They're making tactical decisions about what, what counts. Uh, it, it's a complex calculus. And so the British Empire, uh, as the London Times put it uh, in 1942, they said the British Empire is inherently a self-liquidating concern. In other words, that you know, the British saw themselves as promoting progress and development for the peoples around the globe under their care and protection. And they felt that inevitably, if that job is working, then those people will be ready to cast off the British, as they indeed did very quickly. Uh, so that the dominion and the manipulation, you know, conflicted with the ultimate logic of the British Empire. And when, if you look at the British legacy, I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, they were when they were smart, they recognized that it was not in their interest to maintain political control, to give away sovereignty to newly emerging nation states protect their investments, protect the trade relationships, maintain the trade flow and the profits that came from that, and negotiate their way out of the sticky politics, okay? And they, when they did that, in, you know, they could be quite clever. In India, okay, it was, you know, they, they, they struggled, but they ultimately did it. In Kenya, they held on because they had a, a white highlands. They had British expatriates that had land and property, and they were a kind of colonial lobby. They were brutal in Kenya in a way they weren't. In Aden, they decided that there was, uh, there was the, the gateway to the Suez Canal. So they set up a torture system, and they were brutal in Aden, uh, in, which is part of contemporary Yemen today. So they, 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 you know, they made mistakes. But overall, they managed it. And what they left behind, I mean, when you think about it, for, uh, what is it, a little island with 60 million people? Well, what's that? Uh, an economy smaller than California's. I mean, you think about their residual influence. First of all, the British system of governance, the Westminster parliamentary system, I think stands better stead for newly emerging nations for some kind of political stability than does the US presidential system, which veers towards autocracy more readily. 
Uh, they left behind English as a global language. They left behind uh, massive cultural influence, sufficient cultural influence to make London a global city, to make the city of London financing a lot of those former colonies. Still, even now, you know, uh, what are we nearly getting 80 years past the British Empire, still a major global center. So, in, in a sense, you know, the British struggled with these contradictions and the, 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 the disasters that we know about, the Kenya pacification, the Aden operation, all that, Northern Ireland, okay? They, they, you know, they, they made mistakes, okay? But when it was all done, when they'd mediated those contradictions and liquid their way out, they left behind a legacy that gave them, first of all, the nations they left behind were, you know, moderately stable and had some developmental trajectory. Um, and moreover, they preserved um, a cultural influence, soft power, finance, they, you know, global Britain, I mean, that's the tragedy of the today. They're, they're living off that memory, and they think that somehow they can reproduce this by leaving the European Union, but that's, that's another story. Now, the United States is the same thing. On the one hand, right at our peak of our power in World War II, if you think about all the things that we presided over, okay, uh, you know, we created the Bretton Woods system, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. In fact, if you look at the economic order that we presided over, it's got a gross inequalities, of course, but, you know, the level of world poverty by all the indices is way down, okay? Uh, global health, you know, we, with the UN, we collaborated very closely in establishing the World Health Organizations. A lot of American civic organizations like the Rotary, the Rotary, which is one of the chief artifacts of U.S. global power, has for over 50 years dedicated itself to the eradication of polio on a worldwide scale. So, I mean, that we've had, you know, and there have been all kinds of uh, evangelical churches that sent missions off around the world that, that there, there are countless thousands of these people that are moving constantly. I mean, if you look among your sort of Rolodex of friends and relatives and find, you know, some of your more conservative friends that they're, they're missioning in Central America and West Africa and the Philippines and Cambodia. Uh, so, you know, and part of that is health. And, you know, world health is, you know, is improving substantially. Uh, so there are these aspects of U.S., the liberal order that we constructed, the, the, world, the world Bank, okay? One of the things that the U.S. has stood for and constantly betray since we entered the world stage in 1907, was the international rule of law, the idea of resolution of disputes by law. We, we betrayed that with the International Criminal Court, which is the acme of that apparatus that we constructed. But up to that point, this was one of the hallmarks of the U.S. global order. And when we're going, you know, uh, it's a question of how much of that's going to survive us, like how much survived the British. Did you have a less benign view of it in 1968 when you were occupying Bill? Oh, let me put it this way. No, I, I'm, I'm, how, how can I put it? I mean, I, it's not benign, okay? I don't think it's a benign view, okay? Because the excesses, which I worked on, I write on torture right. as an artifact of U.S. global power. I've looked at coups and written about the U.S. manipulation of coups. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I, I think I've, I've, I've studied and documented more than some the, the, the excesses of, of this. And I teach, of course, on the Vietnam War, and, I, and I, I, I'm teaching it this fall, and I do not hold back in any way, I mean, about the excesses of that war. On the other hand, I mean, I, I, when, when you enter, here's, this, when you become an analyst of empire, all right, you, you shift the locus of your analysis to the systemic operation, and you see how that system functions as a system in comparison with other systems. And you try and understand how it operates, and how it does its, its business, and what kind of things it accomplishes that give it influence and some kind of lasting contribution to humankind and what kind of excesses that it, 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 it does at the time, what monstrosities, and every empire has its monstrosities. It has its excesses, it has its epic br brutality that are horrific, <laughs> okay? Chile is, is one. I mean, we can go through them all. I teach a course on CIA covert warfare in which we march through 
these coups one after the other. And look at the deleterious consequences they had, like Guatemala descending after that succession of coups and intervention into a civil war that killed uh, 250,000 people in which the United States was actively participating in all this. I'm fully aware of that. But you know, when, you, when you talk about empire, you've got to, to understand in its own terms. You've got to engage in this kind of realpolitik systemic analysis to try and understand how it's operating and how it might be changing. And it shifts your locus. I mean, so, for example, you notice I talked about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Personally, domestically, if that had been enacted, it would have had, if, if the democratic progressive forces are correct, would have had substantial deleterious impact on the quality of American democracy. And in the states, really. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, uh, first of all, there was this bizarre arbitration system that was created that, uh, that would transcend the laws of a sovereign nation state. Corporations could, could sue for any kind of restrictive health or environmental legislation that deemed to be damaging to their business, and they could go into a closed arbitration tribunal and, you know, in which they were picking the arbitrators, picking judge and jury, right? And, 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 okay? it was, so <laughs> from a point of view of, of progressive American politics, Elizabeth Warren, the AFL-CIO, such political power as it has left, it's a fading organization. Nonetheless, the Democratic left did everything it could to defeat the TPP. Right. And, uh, and it regarded Trump's uh, cancellation as a, as a victory. Right. On the other hand, okay, so from domestic US politics, that's a victory for progressive forces, environmental, uh, health, safety, unionization, all that, okay? But when we shift our arena to the interplay of empires, you know, as Prime Minister Abe said, China's got one that's worse. There's no environmental protection at all. There's no recognition of, of workers' rights. There's no inspection, you know? There's no verification. It's cash and carry, a very cynical, and China's gonna grab the trade and steer it that way towards China. Our choice is the best of empires. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the imperial conundrum, is the constant tension. Mark Twain said it so, so cleverly. You know, uh, he did this futuristic thing, which I was inspired by. He did a, you know, sort of America 500 years hence, in which he, you know, he argued that, you know, how did he put it? The American Republic, by having trampled upon the liberties of others abroad, learned to do so to itself at home. In other words, that, that what you do abroad, okay, in the development of empire, and Twain hated that. The, he was part of the anti-imperialist movement, all that. You know, you, you bring it. Fake, fake news is the point where CIA black propaganda that appeared in the Chilean election of 1964, where they made up all these stories about Allende, comes back and is, and is dealt to our own population. Well, even more dram dramatically, I, I did a book called Policing America's Empire, and I looked at the origin of U.S. surveillance. And what I found that in the pacification of the Philippines in 1898, the United States Army, which then had no functioning intelligence service, okay, discovered the power of surveillance, the collection, the pervasive surveillance of Philippine society would allow you to correct incriminating information about the two things that are always political scandal, sex or money. And those Filipino political elite who played ball with America had that incrementing information buried. And those that transgressed, who dared to resist and argue, had that information released. Uh, and uh, the man who was the architect of that system, General Ralph Van Diemen, should be a name no, as known well to us in the United States uh, as uh, Jager Hoover. And he was the guy during World War I that set up the Military Intelligence Division. He built the first mass surveillance apparatus in US society. He turned the Military Intelligence Division into a unit of 1,700 men. And working with the Bureau of Investigation, he created an, a, a, a civilian adjunct, a badge-carrying, government-authorized uh, citizen vigilante gumshoes, 350,000 strong. 
and they compiled a million pages of reports on the subversive inclinations of German Americans, Italian Americans, and African Americans, deemed to be in the kind of ethnic template of empire to be the subversive groups. And that, 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 that went, that, that apparatus when in the eve of World War II, there was something called the Delimitation Conference, in which just as the Pope divided the world at the Treaty of Tordesillas, you know, uh, so the, the head of the US Army Intelligence and the FBI sat down and divided the world. And Van Diemen was there representing the army, right? Even though he was long retired, been retired for about 12 years at that point. He came in, they did a division. The US Army got you know, intelligence and the world beyond the Americas. The FBI got counterintelligence and the Americas. And that division was the base division. That division led to the OSS and the CIA and the FBI. I mean, Van Diemen was a man of enormous influence. Well, that skill that he learned was during pacification. He turned that on American society. And I've got the FBI reports to prove it. So, I mean, I, you know, yeah, uh, that, that's, it's, that, it's that imperial conundrum, it's that contradiction between democracy at home and empire abroad. And Britain in the 1950s, because of the, the mobilization of the working class, the claims they could make on the aristocracy and the elite because of their sacrifice during the war, they basically put it to the United Kingdom that the imperial game is over and you are going to build housing, you're gonna provide the National Health Service, you are going to allow us to unionize, you're going to pay us a living wage, you are going to raise our children and ourselves out of the muck that we've been living in for centuries. We are going to take our place in this society. And that meant that when the crunch came at Suez, Britain didn't have it to give anymore. As I always like to say, empire is basically a, it's a 5% game. It's about five to 10% of your GNP. It's which way are you gonna swing? It's that discretionary money. Once you do everything you need to do, that little bit you got left over, it's not much in a budget, but it's, it's enough to do something creative. And Britain, at that point, the working class mobilized and said, well, we're gonna take that, and empire is over, and they did. And we're in a similar turning point now that we're not wealthy, where we're faced with a really severe choice between maintaining this global apparatus and beggaring ourselves at home, or the American people laying claim to those resources, and we're seeing that playing out now. I think all the complex politics we're seeing is really sort of late imperial politics, the politics of imperial decline. Yes? So, what, are, what is China's contradiction? You know, they definitely have their own. Right. So how do you see that playing out? You know, they're doing these infrastructure projects in Africa, building dams, roads. You know, there's going to be a cost to that as well. It's not as uh, overt and heavy-handed as U.S. actions during the Cold War to other nations. But, um, you know, what's the, what's the blowback in your eyes? Yeah, the China specialists that, that are looking for that kind of blowback, they're saying, first of all, that China was, is incredibly arrested. The society is very repressive. You know, massive surveillance, uh, denial of human rights, uh, endless abuses of petty party officials that take people's land without compensation, demolish their homes. Uh, you know, the, the, the poor, the Chinese working class, you know, is, is not doing really well in this whole thing. So there's this belief that there could be this ferment, this reftiness. And because it's a command society, in which dissent is suppressed. We don't know the full extent of it, but China specialists think that it could be quite extensive. And so again, they face the same imperial contradiction between domestic constituencies making demand on that imperial five or 10%. Now, China's got an advantage. It's an ascendant power. It's the terms of trade have advantage it. They, it's manifest in their they're down to three trillion, but a while they had four trillion dollars in foreign exchange, you know, in the bank, ready to expend. They didn't have to go into their budget to do that. And so it's one trillion for the infrastructure, another trillion for Africa, and they're, they're down to three, and you know. So they've, they've got surplus because the, they manipulated the terms of trade to advantage themselves and acquire this asset as a new ascendant power. And in doing that, of course, they held down the wages, and that, that allowed that accumulation, also allowed that entry into the global exchange. And so the question is, you know, 
how long will they run? Well, if China gets 50 years, that's not bad in the global system. But I think it's their ascent now. And one can't say what their contribution, but I think the, the parameters of between domestic pressures and the international aspirations, defense, uh, trade, infrastructure, aid, all that, that's, I think that's, that's evident in China's case as well. Uh, we wrap up here. Okay, thank you.